My name is Deirdre Church. I've been working in the field of public health since 2010, and I've had the joy and the privilege of coming to every CCIH conference since 2010. <laughs> and I just, I really, really love CCIH. I love coming here every year, and the reason that I do is because I really believe that we have so much in common. Every single one of us that come from all over the world have in common two really important things. One, we are very passionate about justice. We're passionate about alleviating human suffering. We are passionate about bringing excellence to uh, our public health service, our medical work. And the second thing is that we're really passionate about our Christian faith where we really desire to bring the love of Christ to other people and to make it evident in the work that we do. And so the session tonight is, continues along that same vein. The title is, Our Sisters and Brothers Keeper, The Role of Faith Communities in Ending Epidemics. And so we have two really dynamic speakers today, today with us. We have Dr. Dave Barstow and Dr. Jono Quick. And most of you are probably very much familiar with both of them. Uh, their full bios are in the program on pages 41 and 50, so you can read more about them. But I am going to give just a little bit of background just so you can understand what the perspective that they bring to this. And so Dr. Barso right here uh, has a PhD in computer science. After a 40-year career that included teaching, industrial research, entrepreneurship, and consulting, he felt called to change direction to focus on the AIDS epidemic. So for the past 10 years, he has worked with local pastors in Southern Africa to help them reduce the stigma associated with HIV and AIDS. He has become involved in global initiatives related to faith and AIDS, working with the World Council of Churches and UN AIDS. He is currently coordinating the Common Voice Initiative with the goal of achieving a strong, unified voice of advocacy and commitment across a broad range of religious traditions. He is also working on a documentary film about the future of the AIDS epidemic entitled How We Lost the War Against AIDS. And also, it was mentioned earlier today, um, he was featured during a CCIH webinar back in January on this topic as well. And then next to him, we have Dr. John, John o. Quick. Uh, he is a family physician, international public health expert, author, and speaker on a, who is on a mission to protect humanity from deadly infectious disease epidemics. And he's no stranger to CCIH. He has spoken many, many times here. Um, he's also the author of The End of Epidemics, The Looming Threat to Humanity and How to Stop It. And I just want to show you the covers, which are actually on both of the screens. This is my copy. This is the um, US version. Um, so this is the cover, just so you can see it. And this is the international version. And you can, um, it's available pretty much on all of the online, you know, Amazon and all the online venues. And you can also get it at Barnes & Noble as well. OK. So he's also senior fellow emeritus and former president and CEO at the Global Health Nonprofit Management Sciences for Health. He's on the faculty of Harvard Medical School and serves as chair of the Global Health Council. He previously was director in essential, of essential medicines at the World Health Organization. His past biblical wisdom for global health, which was also, I believe, mentioned earlier by Lauren, um, his past uh, biblical wisdom for global health CCIH annual conference talks have covered lessons from God's first century leadership team, as well as the intersection of faith with issues such as universal health coverage, women and the millennial development goals, chronic diseases, and technology. And that's just not even all of the information. That's just a brief <laughs> overview. So during our time here this evening, um, this is really going to be an informal conversation that Dave and Jono are going to have. And they're going to share with us their um, like a history of epidemics and their specific work within it. And then they're also going to talk about how we can take practical steps to end epidemics and what our unique role is as Christians when it comes to this work. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to them, and they're going to do this presentation for us. And then afterward, we're going to make sure to save some time for questions and comments. So thank you. 
Right. Thanks very much. Lisa. Thank you, and, and thank you for sharing a, a, pre a precious Saturday evening. Um, this is an issue that we feel really passionate about, and, and so the interest is really appreciated. Um, I saw some quizzical looks when, when Didger used the term version to the two books as if kind of <laughs> the U.S. got something different than the rest of the world. It's actually two different publishers and two different editions. Uh, I mean, two, yeah, two different publishers, but uh, same book except um, the international one, they did paperback, and, and David Hayman wrote a, a nice forward for it, the head of uh, health security at Chatham House. Um, so uh, the fir first, a hey, real shout out to um, Doug and, and Mona and Kathy and, um, and, uh, and Randall and, uh, and the board of CCIH and, and all of the sponsors. I started coming in 2008, and it's just been it's been wonderful to see how it's evolved, to see um, you know, the, the changes in things like the website, but more the conference and the participation. So uh, just a real shout out to, to, to uh, everyone who has kept CCIH um, relevant and growing and, and, and vibrant. We all know that Christians have a particular obligation to heal. The two, two thirds of Christ's three dozen miracles were healing miracles. But is there something, um, is there something extra that Christians and people of faith can really add and are obligated to add to, um, to, re to stop epidemics, to really do something big in a preventive way? And in that sense, are we our, our sisters and brothers and actually sons and daughters keeper? We're gonna follow on Ambassador um, Birch's incredible <laughs> talk last night um, using aid, uh, AIDS and try to answer that question with AIDS and really look at the role of faith communities in um, can and should play in ending epidemics. So we're gonna do a little bit of a tag team thing here. Uh, and uh, with your uh, prayers, we'll do that well. <laughs> Uh, and we will certainly allow time afterwards for questions. If there's a question of clarification that you need to ask right away, go ahead. But otherwise, hold the questions until the end. So, John, why don't you start us off with a history of AIDS? Yeah, briefly. So, I, um, when I was a medical student, when I graduated, AIDS, AIDS didn't exist in any textbook anywhere in the world. It just did not exist. It was not, it was not, it was not there. Uh, and for 60% of the, as we heard um, from, uh, from Dr. Burks last night, 60% of people in, in Africa today, all of those young people under 30 or so, have never lived in a world without AIDS. So it was really the first human pandemic of modern times, the first new human pandemic of modern times. And I think we need to keep that in mind as we see what happened. Um, we, it actually, uh, it actually, now we trace back, uh, scientists have tra traced back, it like three out of four new human pandemic uh, viruses came from an animal to human species jump. And th this happened in the, somewhere in the early 1920s. Um, in, in uh, sorry if Pius is here, it happened in Southeast Cameroon. Um, probably a bushmeat eating, eating monkey. It was originally a simian virus, a monkey virus. Um, made five jumps into people. Finally, one was successful. When a virus jumps into a human, uh, it has to adapt, and, and most of the time it doesn't, fortunately for us. It then worked its way down, down the river to Kinshasa, probably with sexual transmission. And um, at that time, there were Haitian guest workers, and when the Congo became independent. The Haitian guest workers were, were sent back to Haiti. And so uh, you can see on, on, the, uh, on the lower map, it actually started in, in Congo and it spread to the US. And contrary to, uh, to what we thought at the time, it didn't start with either um, Haitians or, or uh, with the West Coast. So this is what things looked like in the year 2000. 20 years into the epidemic, 20 years into the epidemic, we squandered a fair bit of that, that first part um, in the US with a sort of a right versus left uh, uh, standoff. Conservatives were, were moralizing and saying, it's the wrath of God. 
On the other hand, uh, the, the, the more liberal gay population was not allowing any basic public health uh, contract tracing and, and all of that. And we've continued in the U.S. to have multiples the death rate of other countries because we got off to a slow start. On the, on the left there is a 26-year-old Haitian with TB and, and AIDS in, in the year 2000. And it had become a chronic disease in the North. In just three years leading up to 2000, the hospitals were emptied and, and people with HIV were living almost as long as they would have without it. That's the same person three months later with, with his TB. That was the potential that people saw. And, and when, when less than 1% of people in Africa were on treatment. Uh, fast forward a, a, uh, a couple of decades, we got up to, uh, today we're at 17 million from 50,000 people on treatment in the year 2000 in, in, in uh, low income countries. Uh, well, 600, they're counting some of, <laughs> they're counting the US in that. Um, we were, we, but in Africa it was less than 50,000 and, and now worldwide it's 17 million. And it was collective action. It was collective action on a lot of people's parts. But it was not inevitable. It was believed in July of 2000, so this is after hospitals in the North have been emptied. July of 2000, the head of USAID was asked by the Boston Globe, are you gonna do treatment in Africa? You, you saw right there what it does. He said, no, I don't think that's possible. And uh, we're gonna focus on prevention, in, sorry, in June of 2000. And, um, and he was quoted in the New York Times as saying part of the problem was that Africans didn't have a watch and, and didn't know how to tell time. Um, and it, that, he thought it was impossible. Uh, in, in July, July 9th in 2000, on a Sunday evening, the AIDS 2000 Durban opened with 12,000 people, wonderful South African music there. President Mbeki gets up and says, this business about AIDS medicines is a CIA pharmaceutical industry plot, and the problem is poverty. We're not gonna spend anything on that, and that cost about a half a million lives. And so how did, how did, we, get, how did we get this huge explosion? And it was, it was really crashing four barriers. No drugs, the, ad, the advocates beat on the FDA until we got drugs. $12,000 per person per year, um, they, they beat on, on the industry and all, and today we buy the drugs for $120 per person per year, 1% of the price. No money, they beat until we got the, the global fund and so forth. So it was really activists on the ground in, in, in South Africa, and this is a picture from 2000, but it was also a moral commitment by President Bush in the State of the Union in 2003 that launched this. And People who looked at this, historians have looked at this and said, this was not politics in the end. This was not uh, US security. It was a moral decision that he made, and it made all the difference. So John, I'll thank you for the history of the epidemic. The, um, we're now going to take a look at the future. We're going to show you a trailer for a film, a documentary film, that will be made in the year 2030. The film hasn't been made yet, but it will be made in the, in the year 2030. And so we're going to show you the trailer. Imagine the keepers of history looking at us all, seeing the remarkable global response to the AIDS crisis in the early years of the 21st century and seeing that we threw it all away so quickly and now in 2030 wondering why we failed. The AIDS epidemic is now 50 years old. At one point we thought we were going to win the war, but now AIDS has come back worse than ever. 62 million people have died. Within a few years, the war against AIDS will become the deadliest war in human history. My brother was a beautiful spirit. When he died, we held a celebration. We celebrated him, his life, his music. 
We were not helpless. We were not unarmed. We were not without science. The crucial years were between 2015 and 2020. That was when the global response to AIDS started to collapse. And obviously, the collapse meant that many people could no longer get treatment. My father dedicated his life to helping people, but he died a few years after the supply of medications ran out. Such a waste. It's shocking how many opportunities we missed, like needle exchange programs. What really angers me is what happened to young girls. We had that great PETFAR program, but it only lasted a few years. My daughter was a beautiful girl. I couldn't stand to see her shrivel up and die. We come, we cry, we console, we remember. And then the world leaves us to our grief. May the spirits of those who died forgive us. May the families of those who died forgive us. History may forgive us, but I promise you, history will never forget us. You know, 15 years ago, we knew what to do to end the war against AIDS. If only we had done it. Dave, that's pretty depressing. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you think it's that bad? Do you think the risk is that great? That well, we'll, well we'll obviously, obviously, I hope not. And it's not inevitable. It's not an inevitable future. You saw the progress that you talked about, the, the impossible, making the impossible possible. We saw what Ambassador Burks talked about last night. If we build on that, we can end AIDS by 2030. That's still within the realm of capability, but we are at a tipping point. Things could tip the other way, and the trailer depicts the future if things tip the wrong way. So if, if we do tip the wrong way, what will your expert panel say? What will they say was the reason why, why, why we lost what we had? Well, as scientists normally do, they always start with charts. So they're going to look at charts that show the 50-year, remember, this is now a 50-year history of the epidemic. And they look at charts that show the really horrifying statistics that we saw in the early part of the, uh, uh, the first 20 years of the epidemic. Then they'll see all the progress that was made. These, these are the a number of new infections, the number of deaths declining um, from 2000 until late in the 2010s. But then it, it tips up again. And so that's, that's where the panel says, well, you know, we, we really lost control there. And they talk about the, um, the fast track program that was introduced by UNAIDS in 2015 and the goals for that, that they described as 90-90-90. 90% of the people living with HIV know their status. 90% of those are on treatment. And 90% of those have viral suppression. Now, as Ambassador Burke said, the good thing about viral suppression is that it means you can't transmit the disease to somebody else. So that's, that's where we want to get to, a lot of people being virally suppressed. And so they set the goals of 90, 90%, 90%, 90%. Uh, but now the panelists in 2030, looking back at that, they know the numbers that really happened. It was 67%, 57%, 72%, meaning that less than a quarter of the people living with HIV had virally were virally suppressed, which means that the preventive effect of suppression really didn't work very well. Okay. Now, they look at it and, and they note that with this increase in infections, that was really one of the key problems, just the fact that they, things started, the new infections started to go up, and by 2020, there were seven more, seven million more people infected than were in the projections from the fast track target. So in order to care for those 7 million more and to reach the 90%, it would have cost more. So they looked at the global investment. Now, this is now 20 years worth of global investment from 2010 until 2030. And you can see there's a rise in the early part of the 2010s, then kind of stabilizing, but then there's a big cut. And by 2020, there's been a 20% cut in the overall global investment. That's money from donor countries, money from high burden countries. It's total investment. That's a 20% cut. 
And that was the reason that we couldn't get to the 90-90-90. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of mixture between whether it's for low-income countries and globally, including the, the um, other countries. So it's, it's close. Yeah. Good question. Can, can you just go back to the previous slide? So are, are, are we at the point of no return already? And then going, going back to the cost side? Uh, 30 years ago, the first report started coming out about, about global warming. And we were really, really slow. And we're, we are past the point of no return. We're never going to get back some of the things. But many, we're never going to get back the parts of, of Antarctica that are falling apart. And we're going to lose a good part of Florida and, and so on. We, we did get past the point of no return. Are, are we, would we be past the point of no return there? In Surprisingly of enough, the panelists talked about that very question. And they looked at these charts. And they said, you know, OK, suppose we know there was a cut leading up to 2020. If we'd made a big investment in 2021 or 2022, could we have regained control of the epidemic? And the first thing you observe, you'd have to put in a lot more money than you had taken away because of the higher number of people living with HIV. And so they couldn't tell whether we'd be able to get it back. But it was going to cost a lot more money than if we hadn't had those cuts in the first place. And we heard last night there's this eight eight year uh, quiet time when somebody's infectious but not symptomatic, young and and that that really keeps the flame going. So, after looking at charts like this, the panelists then go on to other issues and they try to take the whole fifty year history of the epidemic in play. And the first thing that they talk about are the social drivers, saying they really didn't pay enough to the social drivers: gender based violence stigma, poverty, malnutrition, all those things that exacerbate the epidemic didn't pay enough attention. And they recalled a remark by Jonathan Mann, who was the leader of the first WHO AIDS response in the late, late 80s. Uh, and he said something like, AIDS is a social issue that happens to have some medical aspects. And the panelists, thinking back on that remark, said, you know, there was an awful lot of wisdom in that. I just wish we'd paid more attention to it. Then they got into a kind of a blame game. And they say, look, the thing that really hurt us was when American leadership weakened in the late 2010s. And obviously, it had weakened. But then somebody said, look, you can't just blame it on the Americans. Think of all the leadership the Americans showed from 2000 all the way through till, till 2015 and beyond. We would be nowhere near as, as well off as we are, despite this, the statistics, if there hadn't been that American leadership. So it's far too easy to blame American politicians. They point out there are some other countries, the high burden countries, the high province countries. If they had put more money in earlier, if they hadn't been like Cabo and Becky, then they wouldn't have been so dependent on donor funds. So that when the American leadership got weak, they could have controlled their, their epidemic on their own. Also, there are many countries that ignored the epidemic or thought it really only applied to people they didn't care about. So why should they worry about it? So there's a lot of blame to go around. He also looked at some other issues. One is that they, they said the policies and practices often weren't well aligned with scientific evidence. And they pointed to harm reduction for injection drug users. Those programs could have gone out a lot earlier and would have had a lot stronger effect. They lost the trust of the people. When the stockouts and the, the problems in delivery in the early 20s happened, then people no longer trusted the medical establishment. Now, people were still working on vaccines. A vaccine was finished in 2023. It's partially effective, about 60%. But it, it would have made a big difference in prevention. But by that time, the people who needed to be vaccinated didn't trust the medical establishment at all. They might have thought it was another CIA plot. And finally, they talk about the youth, the new infections among young people. And their conclusion was there was a question of education, and that all those young people just hadn't learned enough about the different prevention options to be able to prevent themselves from becoming infected with HIV. So that's the kind of thing I would expect them to talk about on the panel. Okay. I had, um, 
Can you then then um, talk about whether did you have any controversies? <laughs> Strange that you would ask. Yes, we had had some controversies. In fact, there was one topic that generated a whole lot of argument. What do you think? Religion. Bingo. It was religion. They spent a lot of time talking about whether or not religion helped or hurt the global AIDS response. So one panelist said he really thought that people of faith, religious leaders, should have done more. Another panelist said, wait, wait a minute. You know who the people were who were on the front lines at the very beginning? It was people of faith. It was faith-based organizations. They were there at the very front. And they're there at the forefront now. So 50 years they've been out there. And there have been studies that have consistently shown throughout the 50 years that between 30 and 50% of the medical services for people living with HIV are provided by faith-based organizations. And he even pulled up, one of the panelists pulled up a slide that Rick Warren had used in 2007. It was a map of Rwanda that showed where the clinics were and where the hospitals were. And there were just a few of them. Then he, then he overlaid that with a map of Rwanda that showed where all the churches were. It's a huge number, right? And the point was that there's this huge infrastructure among churches and other uh, faiths that we can take advantage of and we did take advantage of it early in the epidemic. So that was that, that first argument. The second argument was about stigma and discrimination. And there was a total consensus among the panelists that stigma and discrimination had been major barriers to effectively fighting the epidemic throughout the history of the epidemic. The argument was about what local faith communities could have done or should have done to make a difference. Um, and they, the panelists recognize that there's kind of a tricky balance that a local faith community has to do because part of the job of local faith community is to provide guidance about leading a life that would please God. But on the other hand, how do you provide that guidance without stigmatizing people or any of us when we don't lead the lives just the way we think God would like us to lead them? So it's, it's a, a tricky question. It's not an easy thing. But the consensus was that local faith communities really should have done a better job of somehow finding that balance. Now, one of the panelists points out that there were a lot of faith communities that did a really good job, that they aggressively talked about stigma, about taking care of our brothers and sisters. So they really did a good job. Another panelist says, but not enough of them. Remember that study that was done in 2021? It showed it was in sub-Saharan. It was in the uh, sub-Saharan Africa, and they looked at the numbers of faith communities that are stigmatizing, as opposed to those who are not stigmatizing. Over half were stigmatizing. Less than ten percent were actively fighting against stigma. I mean, though, you know, the numbers had to be swapped. <laughs> if we wanted to make progress against stigma, we needed half of the faith communities helping instead of hurting. So that was kind of a devastating study to hear about. The third part of the argument was when one of the panelists said, you know, global religious leaders really should have done a better job of advocating. But then none of the panelists point out, wait a minute, remember that CCIH panel? back at that meeting back in 2018. <laughs> Remember what Ambassador Burke, she was head of PEPFAR then. Remember what she said? She said, faith communities and, faith and religious leaders were the reason we got PEPFAR. So there's a lot of good global advocacy. And there was more advocacy in the second half of the 2000s. But then somebody else pointed out, the time when we really needed it was the second half of the 2010s as the global AIDS response started to weaken, that was when we really needed prominent religious leaders to get together, speak strongly and in unison. It says, this is a disease that we have a moral obligation to defeat. And so if you, if you look at these three areas, at infrastructure and social drivers and global advocacy, uh, how would you rate how the uh, religious community did? 
Yeah, well, I'm not doing the rating. It's the panelists in the, the future. Panel, excuse me. How did the panel, <laughs> how, how did the panel rate them? And, and when we, we'll open this up when we, when we get to the You guys can rate them differently later if you want. So for infrastructure, the little check show there? Good. Yes. Yeah, for infrastructure, absolutely great. Total unanimity among the panelists that uh, with respect to using infrastructure, faith communities were, were, were great. With respect to social drivers, some good, but probably on balance, it hurt more than it helped. For global advocacy, some good stuff, just not enough, especially in the second half of the 2010s when we really needed that, the religious leaders to be prominent in their advocacy. So that's, um, that's a view from uh, 2030 on, on AIDS. Um, unfortunately, AIDS isn't the only thing that confronts the world. Right now, we're, we're on a major effort to end at least four different epidemics of significant AIDS, TB, um, malaria, and, and polio. And we're in different ways along the line in, in doing that. Um, but we, are, we have every reason to believe that we've got more uh, outbreaks that have the potential to become global pandemics that, that we, we're, we're facing. So we're gonna, the next documentary um, is one that's actually been made, a uh, CNN documentary, and uh, it's called The Unseen Enemy. Look and pay attention to the risk factors and to the call to action in, in this. The World Health Organization has declared a swine flu pandemic. The Zika virus continues to infect people. The new respiratory virus called MERS. SARS killed nearly 300 A big people. outbreak of the deadly Ebola virus. The outbreak spread widely and cannot be contained. There is such a thing as being too late. If we do nothing, it's not a matter of if there will be a global pandemic. It's just a matter of when. Our world is globalizing ever more. That's fantastic from the perspective of a virus because in no time it can infect hundreds of thousands of people. Here's what a worst case scenario pandemic would look like. First, there would be a jump from some animal species to the people close to those animals. It would not be regionally confined for long at all. The large number of casualties and the deaths are unthinkable. Shanna was in her senior year of high school. The doctor said it was just the flu, that it had to run its course. 911, what is going on there? My daughter, she's not breathing. Even the most healthy person is taken away from this planet within a couple of days. We are imposing changes in the world thoughtlessly. This is an issue of human life. It should be thought of in the same way that we think of terrorism, protection against national disasters, against national defense. You hope the world has the capacity to see an outbreak, mobilize forces, and contain it. We have a chance to stop something that otherwise could be horrific, but it's going to take all of us. So it's really act now or pay later. Now, one of the points of that documentary, Jono, was that it's not if, it's when. Now, you've written a book, The End of Epidemics, and in there you, you describe some things that could be done so that that when actually doesn't happen. So actually, what, uh, what Larry Bryant said there was, if we do nothing, it's not, it's not a matter of if, but when. And so that's the question. What, what do we need to do so that it doesn't happen? And in the, um, uh, in the sort of peak of the, of the Ebola outbreak, the West Africa Ebola outbreak in, in 2014, um, we started looking ahead and saying, what do we think is going to happen based on what I, I started looking ahead and said to myself, based on what we saw with AIDS and the times lost, what we've seen with the whole series of other uh, influences and uh, a, the first new virus of the 21st century, SARS, which came out of China in 2003 and spread to 27 countries within weeks. Um, what have we seen after each of these? We've seen a pattern of panic, lots of, lots of headlines, lots of reports, 
thousands of papers or uh, piles of uh, thousands of pages of reports on 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 SARS, which which knocked travel to Asia in half and was hugely devastating um, economically. Um, and then three years later, the promises aren't kept. So so we started looking back at the last hundred years of all of these these outbreaks and epidemics and and asked the question. What would it take to keep local disease outbreaks, which are always going to happen, we're always going to have outbreaks that kill tens or hundreds of thousands. That's nature. As Louis Pasteur said uh, over 100 years ago, the, the, the microbes will always be with us. But the difference between those outbreaks and, and catastrophic epidemics is more often than not human action or inaction. So we, we, we looked at what are, what are the sort of the key levers, the, the things that really would make a difference, and who are the examples, who are the heroes? Uh, the, the, the book, <laughs> the first third of, of the end of epidemics is, is about the problem. And it, it, my, I had a collaborator on this, and, and she couldn't sleep during some of the chapters. <laughs> but, but then the, the last two thirds is hopeful because it's really clear, it's very clear what needs to be done. And so the, these, um, each of these areas, the leadership, um, health systems, um, active, active prevention, um, timely truths, the information, innovation, they're very concrete th things that need to be done. The cost, this is the thing, the cost of, of, um, of doing what we need to do, the investment, every year over the next 20 years to make the world substantially safer is about a dollar per person per year for everyone on the planet. And so um, that, that's, a, that's a, 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 I mean, money should not be the limiting factor given the, the magnitude of the risk. Um, and finally, one of the things we've learned looking back at, at the, the, the century and particularly that we've learned from AIDS is the whole power of citizen activists including the, the faith community. I want to give just a couple of examples uh, from each of these. One, it, it's very clear the single most important thing we can do in order to prevent the, these local outbreaks from becoming catastrophic is strong local health systems down to the community. Time makes all the difference. The, the reason why the, the outbreak, if we, the, the Africa had successfully put back in the box 22 previous outbreaks of Ebola since Ebola was first discovered in, in the 90s, and none of them with more than a few hundred cases and fewer deaths. What made the difference here was the time lost because of, for a variety of things. Some were the, health, the local health systems, some was a, a um, with all due respect to very good colleagues from there, what was, was a, 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 a less decisive, less active World Health Organization. The reason why SARS, that, that n the first new pathogen of the 21st century, got put back in the box in six months. I told you it was in 27 countries in, in a matter of weeks. It got put back in the box in, in, within six months. And we haven't had a, a, any, any more than a few odd cases of SARS since then. The, and it was one or two plane f flights short of getting into countries that couldn't have controlled it. The key thing was very early in the process, WHO had information that this was going on. Um, the head of, of, of infectious disease there called the director general on a Saturday in March and, and he, he said, Dr. Brooklyn Grow, this is killing health workers, which is the canary in the coal mine, it's crossing borders, and she declared a global emergency. Uh, the mayor of Toronto was furious because Toronto is one of the cities and, and clothes Toronto and they cancel Elton John concerts. But the point is that, that it's early detection. This is where the faith community comes in. It's not primary care or outbreak detection. It's not either or, it's in both. And we can do a lot more of that. The second thing, one of my favorite stories from, from doing the book was in Sierra Leone. The stu the, so this is the number of weekly cases in Sierra Leone. And um, the epidemic took off, uh, and um, the story that the West hears is that West Africa was a mess, and uh, the health systems didn't work, and all that. That's true. That's how it got started. The success story that isn't told is how quickly the outbreak was stopped once the local leaders, local groups took over. 
once the, the 4,000 market women were involved, it, once the religious community were involved, uh, people would say uh, that, you know, I heard this business on the radio about not touching the dead and all that, but I didn't believe until my sheik told me. And, 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 and that really made the difference. It's the trusted sources. So um, what could kill millions and devastate economies worldwide? These are four categories of the, the sources of viruses that could, in a matter of two years, kill 200 to 400 million people. Um, that's about what a, what a nuclear exchange would, call, would cost. Uh, and it would knock the global economy as bad as 2008, which, which countries are still put millions of people out of work. And so um, this, this, is not, this is not science fiction. These are real possibilities. If we could talk about the fact that North uh, Korea has uh, their, their bio labs have a dozen pathogens of pandemic potential, including probably smallpox and definitely anthrax. They haven't weaponized them, but, but those are the risks. So we, the risks are growing and real. Scientists and public health people know what to do, but we're moving too slowly and, and to, to, to protect humanity. This is pretty scary, right? Uh, and so you can see why we want public health authorities to deal with this. But we also want people of faith to deal with it. And I know that you've done some work on, on the biblical uh, imperative for us to deal with issues like this. So I think we're... We know, I think most of us know well the sort of tradition of, of Christian dedication to caring. And, and we, um, to be a little bit uh, pejorative, we earned our stripes as a faith um, in part in the first few centuries by being responsive to the plagues that uh, ultimately undid the Roman Empire. And this is just a, a, a Easter Sunday in 2060 AD. By the way, all of what I'm saying is real compared to. <laughs> 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 um, and, and our challenge is to be sure that what he's saying doesn't become real. Uh, most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Uh, heedless of the danger, uh, realizing that in doing that, um, they would they would soon uh, join the, the departed, and so that kind of caring and all is 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 there. The question is, are we are we compelled for something bigger than this? And um, I found I'm not Catholic, and I don't agree with a few of the Pope's um, points of view on things. But um, his his encyclical uh, Laudito Si, um, which is um, it's actually short for an Italian phrase Laudito Si, uh, mi Signor, um, praise be to your uh, praise praise be to your Lord, praise be to you Lord, and um, he really developed um, a, a a sense that we have an obligation to care for the world, and um, obstructionist attitudes and even the part of believers can range from denial of the problem to indifference, nonchalant resignation, blind confidence, same kind of thing we see with epidemics. We need a universal solidarity, an intergenerational solidarity. I know that we're leaving the next generation a world that is less sustainable because we overuse fossil fuels. fuels. I, and, and I don't want to leave them a, a world that's, that's, that's more dangerous. Um, and that we should use our vocation to help protect um, God's handiwork. So um, I think those are, those are, that provides a, a kind of a theology for why we should really um, be, in, be, um, be involved in this. And um, I think going back to, to the critical period and all, um, and you said, they said in there they wish they had done a better job. Can you talk a little bit because you, you've begun to develop an initiative that is meant to keep the community involved. Yeah, this is actually in response to what the panelists said, who we needed more advocacy during the second half of the 2010s. And of course, right now is 2018, right? So we're right in the middle of the second half of the 2010s. So um, a group of us have been working on something that we call the Common Voice Initiative. And our goal with this is to build a strong movement of advocacy and commitment 
to ending AIDS that crosses a very broad range of religious leaders and traditions. So it's sort of the full spectrum of Christianity as well as, as Muslims and Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, as broad a range as we can get. Uh, and to have that serve as a kind of global conscience so that maybe the political and economic leaders will listen and hear that first that we actually do have the capability to end AIDS and that we have a moral obligation to do so. And our assumption, our premise in this work is that we'll be stronger if we focus on what unites us among all of those religious traditions rather than what divides us. It's like the theme of this conference, the power of partnership. This is the power of partnership. So for me, this kind of resolves some contradictions that, that I had seen in the last 10 years that I've been working on AIDS. Uh, I'll cite one example was when the AIDS conference in 2012 was in Washington. There were two separate meetings of people of faith. And there was one that was kind of liberal oriented and one that was kind of conservative oriented. But why on earth were there two? They should have been talking together then. Should have had just one. But another one was in the 2016 conference in Durban. There was a panel of, um, and, and uh, the, the notion on the panel was that uh, it was a panel about theology and sexual identity. And they were saying, well, you know, theology and doctrine have to evolve to match these new notions of sexual identity. And then somebody pointed out, you know, theology and doctrine are pretty slow to evolve, you know. <laughs> We're, we're talking decades or centuries here. So what about all the people that are gonna die in the meantime? Can't we do something that doesn't require changes of theology or changes of doctrine? Isn't there some things that we can do together without that kind of uh, issue? And so that, for me, that crystallized the problem. The problem is that we too often allow differences in theology or dogma or doctrine to get in the way of bringing the full power of religion and faith to fighting epidemics like AIDS. So uh, common face, we're, voice, we're trying to overcome that. Uh, and so as I said, a group of us have been working informally for the last nine months or so. It includes some people who are um, members of CCIH, so thank you very much for your contributions. Uh, and what we've been trying to do, oh, sorry, I forgot a key thing. I knew I was going to blow it. The, um, <laughs> the resolution to, the, to that contradiction that I noticed was last year when I heard two different people say the same thing. One was a committed conservative Christian committed to ending AIDS. One was a liberal Christian committing to ending AIDS. And they both said the same thing. They said, we can't treat our way out of this epidemic. So what they were saying was that the social issues are a big part of it. Same thing that Jonathan Mann said. And social issues are in the realm of religion and faith. So that's the way for us to play a role. And the thing that gives me hope is that the same thing was said by these two people on opposite ends of a spectrum. So maybe there is a hope of finding a common voice. And these are some examples of the things that we have tried to find ways to articulate. We talk about common values, like a, a, the, the goal of treating all human beings, the need to treat all human beings with dignity and respect, which we heard about in an earlier panel today. The obligation to reach out to the marginalized and protect the vulnerable. We've heard that several times. We've also talked about misuses of religious beliefs and practices, like judgmental attitudes that lead to stigma and discrimination, as we've seen in the case of AIDS especially, but also things like a, a reliance on faith healing. The power of faith is great, but we can't let people depend solely on that and stop using their ARVs, as we heard earlier today. Also, a set of commitments that we can make together for actions that we can take together one of which is global advocacy. Right now, we need that global advocacy, and that's something that we can do uh, collectively together. But another example is um, remind all of our members that we all have a personal responsibility to prevent HIV transmission. And in order for us to exercise that, that responsibility, 
we need to educate everybody. So don't hide things. Educate everybody on all the different prevention options, like didn't happen to the youth in that trailer. So those are some examples. The, um, where we're going next is uh, at the AIDS conference next weekend, we'll complete our initial draft, which we are going to take as a starting point um, and then go through a several month process of revision, refinement, with consultations and reviews in various forms. Make sure we get a broad base of religious traditions uh, fully in involved and engaged. Uh, and frankly, we'd like to have uh, CCIH either officially involved or unofficially, some of the member organizations, we're, you're quite welcome. Uh, and then we hope to finish by World AIDS Day, the completed document of these, um, and also uh, a global advocacy campaign to come out um, at the same time. So what will it look like when Common Voice has done its job along with everyone else? Well, you know, you never know how these things are going to work out. Um, if the Common Voice, and you know, it's a strong enough initiative and the politicians and the economic leaders listen to it and actually make the right decisions and we tip in the right direction, that'd be tremendous and I hope we can push us in that way. And if it happens, then there won't be a need for that documentary you saw in 2030. In 2030, we'll be making a very different documentary. The, um, the question of whether we have a, an obligation that is beyond the individual disease. I, I think that, um, that uh, we, what we've seen, the other thing we've seen looking back at the last 100 years is the power of, of social movements when a lot of different people in different ways come together. Uh, Common Voice, all of the advocacy around the Global Fund, all of what the groups here are doing. If we're all going in roughly the same direction, committed with those goals, um, I think it's, it's, yeah, I know it's in our ability to win the war against AIDS and to break that cycle of complacency. I'm convinced we can. The question is, will we? And with that, we hand back to Deidre and to, to uh, you for questions and discussions. And thank you for uh, sticking with us for the, for the, uh, for the whole run here. Thank you so much for sharing. And I think we can all agree that was really interesting how you had an interwoven story of really a cautionary tale of what things could look like. And with you providing the facts from the background and where we are now, showing that we could be really in danger of that, but also giving us hope with some solid examples of what we can do to make changes and how we can work together and especially how we as a faith community can have a really important and solid role in that and reminding us of all the success and the work that we've done thus far already. So thank you so much. So we are gonna, we have time for just a couple of questions and I'm gonna say something really quickly though, that because we are filming this, if you can please wait until I bring the mic to you before you start talking, that would be great so that we can capture you on the video. Hi, thanks. For, Dave Robinson um, was with World Vision in the Ebola response in Sierra Leone. Thank you very much for your challenge, your inspiration, your vision. Um, have you seen the exhibit outbreak at the Smithsonian, which just opened? I um, love it. And I, if you're, go ahead. And, you, and well, I'll the question is, you. my question is, have you been invited to do this as a webinar the, uh, for them? Um, it just opened a couple weeks ago. This is a focus on epidemics. It originally was designed for, as a historical on the Spanish flu, the anniversary of the Spanish flu uh, from 1918. And nowhere in the exhibit is the role of faith leaders mentioned in the eradication of smallpox, in the fight on polio, or the fight on Ebola. And I know that this is a, a year, this is a three year exhibit at the Smithsonian, yeah. and they will have an ongoing webinars and discussions about it. What you've presented to us tonight 
would be fantastic as an advocacy uh, addition to that exhibit. And I just put it out there to af offline afterwards to Great. talk about it because what you said to us tonight needs really to go viral. Thank you. Well, and thank you for that. And actually, we do. We've we've actually a couple of weeks ago we're meeting with them um, at, at the Smithsonian. This is a great exhibit, and one of the things they've done this very differently. There is a do-it-yourself, and I actually have a slide that I usually use. There's a do-it-yourself version. I think they've done the best job of getting good language and 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 really good communication, and they want this out in countries. They launched it at the, um, the Prince Mayendal conference in January. The Thailand did their own Thai version. They've got a bunch of different language versions already. So keep that in mind because they will, they will provide the, the help to do that and it's really helpful. And I, I'm convinced that unless we have an educated, we have, we need the professional folks educated. We need the public educated to, to be sure that we press on the politicians. So I don't, I, be, I think we can succeed, but it really depends on having more people on board. Um, so I'm happy if anybody wants, if any, yeah. yeah, if anybody wants to get put in touch with the Smithsonian, how you can do that, get this exhibit in your own programs, uh, just let me know. Yeah. And, and, and that would help in one of the problems with the AIDS epidemic is that a lot of people think it's over. Yeah. Right? You know, if, if you do a survey, you're gonna find a whole lot of people who say, oh, we saw that back in 2008, didn't we? We got all the meds, why are we worried about it now? And the reality is we're at that tipping point. Okay, we got And it. then we're gonna, after we have a question or a comment here, and we're gonna take one more question because we're gonna go by the clock back there, which is two minutes slow, so that will give us just two extra minutes. So after this one, we'll have one more. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. My name is Megan Vedek. I work with Samaritan's Purse. Um, I'm normally on the emergency side, so I've worked in a few epidemics, um, and that's where my passion is. Um, but recently, we, as Samaritan's Purse, applied for an OPTA funded grant to um, for epidemic disease preparedness. Unfortunately, we didn't get it, but it pushed us to really see how we have this vast network, um, just even in our own organization, that's connected to the churches. And we would love to, to do what you just pushed us to do here, which is to really you know, be in the community, um, strengthen the infrastructure, but also prepare. Um, but how do we start that? It's, you know, when I look at our global programming, we're doing a really great job in, you know, in our country offices. We're also doing a great job in our disaster response. But finding that middle ground of preparedness is not easy. <laughs> Um, and trying to find those steps along the way. I don't know if you have any suggestions. Well, yeah, uh, thank you for that. I didn't set this up, but if you go on the MSH website, you'll find a community, um, a, a community uh, develop, how do you say it? Community preparedness for pandemics, more or less package. And, um, and, and so a lot of work's been done on that. And, and so that, and you, it's, you know, you're welcome to, to figure out how to apply it. And uh, yeah. Thank you. Well, one, one other thing to add to that is um, the, the, when I was working in Sub-Saharan Africa on the stigma, one of the things, that we found that different denominations work differently. Some were kind of top down and some were kind of bottom up. And so you had to sort of go one at a time and say, what's the best way to work within this organization to do, it, we always wanted to work done at the local level, but depending on the way the denomination was organized, we had to do it differently. Uh, and another piece of it, though, is this collective stuff. If we can get faith groups to work collectively together in a community, we're going to get a lot of power out of that. My name is Tom Welty. I work with uh, Cameron Baptist Convention Health Services, and I had the privilege of also working at CDC for a couple of years. And at CDC, they promoted partner notification very greatly, and I was there when HIV emerged, but it seemed like somehow we lost the message when it came to HIV. No one has really been promoting that, and since 2007, in Cameroon, we've been doing partner notification, and we've now done that on over 20,000 index persons, and <clears throat> about 50% of the sexual contacts are positive. And I'm just thinking, if we're really gonna to get to where you have your favorable report, somehow we need to rediscover the importance of partner notification. 
And I'd like to hear your thoughts about that. Well, I was just going to ask, how many countries here do partner notification? They have some, is it, you're not doing, you are, is that, no one else, is, you may not know, okay. So why well, aren't more people putting up their hands? What did yeah. they do wrong? Mm. I, yeah, that's and this, I'm going to say, Go this, this is one where I feel like there was one extreme that was a little bit too strong, and that was the, the worry about the stigmatizing effect and the kinds of discussions that people are going to have. And, and in my opinion, there was an overemphasis on that, but in order to overcome the stigma and so that it was okay to talk with your partner, then that's when we required the kind of more uh, loving discussions that faith communities could do could have that would make it easier to have the discussions. Now, you, you know, your experience sounds like it worked pretty well, so go well, for it. And I think the fact that it, it worked well, and I think the fact that it was done through a faith-based organization, yeah. some of the people we talked to, they said, why didn't you start this 20 years ago? They were appreciative when we mm -hmm. talked to the partner and said, we think, you, you've been exposed to HIV. We can't tell you any more than that. You be, better get tested. And people really appreciated that. So I think we lost 20 years in yeah. dealing with this epidemic simply by thinking mm -hmm. there's some exceptional thing about HIV that you can't do <laughs> partner notification when we were trained many years ago that that's how you combat epidemics. Well, so one of the characteristics of development, probably a lot of, a lot of different things, is a show-me culture. And when, when you're asking people or suggesting uh, people do something they've never seen done before, what's going on in their head is why they can't do it here. And when you start showing them people who've actually done it and they see the value, then what's going on in their head is, well, okay, how can we make that work here? So I think probably, um, you, you get, the most powerful thing you can do is get other countries to come over and visit and see what, we what you're doing. We have people from Kenya and Kane. Um, sorry. Oh, do we? Maybe we can take this up oh, afterwards. Sorry. Yes, yeah. okay. Oh, well, <laughs> Thank you, That's Deirdre. a good lead-in to say that Jono and Dave have agreed to stay after as well, just in case people have questions and want to just talk things through, because it sounds like this brought up a lot of creativity and a lot of um, ideas. So um, I'm going to pray for us so that folks can feel free to um, go ahead and enjoy the, the rest of your evening. But if you'd like to either talk to Jono about his book or talk to Dave about the documentary or talk about um, you know, any of the things that we've been discussing, feel free to stay afterwards. So I'm just going to um, say a prayer for us. Thanks so much. Dear God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for bringing us all here together at this conference, teaching us so much, helping us to learn more about you and more about how we can effectively work together in this world. And God, we just thank you so much for this evening and this session. Thank you for everything that Jono and Dave were able to share. And God, we just pray that you would continue to touch us, continue to lead us and guide us. We know that by your strength and with your wisdom, and by your power that we can do great work together. Help us to be unified as believers. And we just thank you so much. And I just pray for each person here that you would help each one as they go back to their rooms, go back to wherever they're gonna spend this night, God, that you would help each person to have a beautiful night's sleep, that we would feel refreshed and ready for another great day tomorrow. And we just thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you.